Hello, and welcome to The Right Idea, where we discuss the policy, the politics, and the people that drive Texas. I'm your co-host, Brian Phillips. I run the communications shop here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And as always, my, with my co-host, Derek Cohen, who's our chief of policy. No, you're not seeing things. This is The Right Idea podcast, and I am wearing a tie. And that's because we are, this is TPS week. TPS stands for Texas Policy Summit. This is Texas Public Policy Foundation's annual conference, where we bring in the policymakers and the experts uh, to talk about you know, all the reforms and all the things that we're going to do in the legislative session, all the problems and challenges that we're facing here in Texas. And literally right on the other side of me or of the cameras right now, uh, we have the policy conference going on. Everything is, is super buzzy. We've got people running around. We've got sessions going on. And, and literally on the other side of me are two of my favorite people in the world are Lynn Woolley and Jim Cardle, who are actually doing their show, their show, the real pros <laughs> that know how to do this, uh, doing their show and, and recording interviews. Uh, so there's a lot going on here, mm -hmm. Derek. So uh, so we're at Texas Public or Texas Policy uh, summit. It's it's been rebranded now. It's the inaugural Texas Policy Summit. I have over 160 legislative staff and members that are here uh, uh, talking about policy and reform. So you know we're only about halfway through. But what do you make of the conference so far? I have to say, Brian, the one takeaway that I have is just the absolute peak level energy that we're having here. Mm. You know, I can't think of a single session, uh, whether it's in a breakout or on stage, where that seemed milk toast, non-committal, or where you kind of came away not understanding what it was the speakers were trying to go through. The the energy, the motivation, mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. Not, I mean, I'll even say it. We haven't seen it at this forum before, mm -hmm. you know, at this particular level. Just, you know, kind of a testament to what TPPF is out there doing, um, the ideas that we're discussing, and the people that we're having to come in and discuss it. We have a rock star lineup, um, certainly of keynotes. We've already had the governor spoke yesterday. Mm -hmm. He gave the, the keynote at lunch. This morning we had the Speaker of the House uh, give his speech and his comments on what he, where he thinks the direction of the legislative session is going. And then this afternoon is going to be the lieutenant governor. And mm -hmm. then after that, in the, into the evening, we're going to have uh, the Texas uh, Education Agency Commissioner, Mike Morath. I mean, what's going on in education in Texas? politics these days. <laughs> um, and so uh, most of you, most of these will have already been done by the time we release this episode. Um, if you're interested, if you missed the conference, we're going to have all of this is going to be online. You'll be able to see all the archives and all the speeches. Uh, but so far, as I said, we've had the governor has given his speech and his outline, uh, as well as the speaker. I will say I want to get your take on the on the governor's speech uh, first. Um, mm -hmm. I have not seen a more unequivocal, unapologetic uh, uh, case for school choice from any public official, with save perhaps maybe even the lieutenant governor, uh, than I did uh, yesterday watching the governor's speech. You know, that is a real sea change, I think, in Texas. What, oh, yeah. do, what do you think that pretends? I remember coming out of that particular talk, you know, remember like that, that ad from the 80s, I think it was RCA or what have you, where the guy was in the chair and the speaker just kind of blew him backwards. Right, it was like, yeah. Not to show our age or anything, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, we missed that. I should, I must say, yes, I definitely should. I mean, I remember seeing this in a museum once. No, but, <laughs> but no, all, all joking aside is you said unequivocal and there's no other word for it. Um, that was the most impassioned, uh, directly delivered incontrovertibly pro-school choice speech I have ever seen, yeah. and I've been, de I've been dealing in this space uh, for quite some time. Not only did he lay out what it exactly it is that we are going to do in Texas and the benefits that these kids are going to get and why we're going to do this because we want the Texas children to be number one across all categories, yeah, right. and that's the way to get there. Not only did that, he went ahead and identified, you know, a lot of times when, you know, in speech writing, they say, well, you don't want to necessarily give voice, give air to your opponent's um, talking points. Sure. Well, he identified them mm -hmm. and then gave them all a public execution. <laughs> so every, every... Metaphorical, metaphorical. Yeah, every well, fallacy... Canceled. Yes. <laughs> yeah, to clarify, <laughs> yeah. Every, yeah, Apple might put us up to explicit. Um, but no, every, every item that we've heard fallaciously uttered about this will destroy uh this will destroy public schools mm -hmm. this will decimate rural communities yeah all that stuff all that chicken little nonsense mm -hmm. that has that is that we've heard not only in this state when charter schools went through but in other states when full school choice went through never came to be mm -hmm. but we for some reason think texas is going to be an exception there and the sky is going to fall right on chicken little yeah 
rather than actually go ahead and provide these kids with opportunity. Look, this is going to be a fight. I mean, Texas has, you know, and I I will say it, you know, directly, Texas has been a bit of a national embarrassment in the fact that we are such a conservative state Mm -hmm. and we have nothing like what 31 other states have Mm -hmm. when it comes to school choice. Um, And so this is going to be a fight. And so for him to come out and and, and say, we're going to go and take the fight to uh, these folks and we're going to, we're going to, no, we're going to hear their their false arguments and we're going to go and and, and uh, educate the people on the truth mm-hmm. and i think uh, to your point his real the, the biggest takeaway line uh from yesterday probably the one that got reported on the most was he said look you know 20 years ago the opponents of school choice at the time we were fighting for charter schools and opponents of school choice made the same exact arguments they said oh this is going to decimate public schools this is going to defund public schools and we won't even have high school football <laughs> if we have charter schools. And, and he said, you know, today we have 350,000 uh, charter school kids. We have a wait list of 60,000 uh, kids who are waiting to get into charter schools. And high school football has never been stronger. Uh, and, and, then you, and then, of course, he mentioned that his high school won the, the state championship. So. To say nothing about how many Super Bowl rings uh, were, are, for, are on players' hands that came from Texas <laughs> high school football during that time. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so, so you're absolutely right. It wasn't just an unequivocal, unapologetic case for school choice you know he's taking the fight to the folks uh he's getting in the foxhole with the rest of us Mm -hmm. uh and we're and we're gonna fight this one other uh issue that he mentioned yesterday which i thought was a little bit of a change in his rhetoric um was was on property tax Mm -hmm. and he has been saying um uh routinely you know this is going to be the largest property tax cut in the history of the state you know at least 15 billion you know maybe even more i saw that he reported the other day he said maybe even more but he also said not only are we going to have the largest property tax cut in history but it's going to last. We're going to have lasting right. relief. And I think that's a really important message mm-hmm. that people need to understand is that not only are we going to get this big tax cut because we have all this money uh, from our surplus, but we're going to make structural changes. Uh, so we're not back here in five years, right? Because that would just anger everybody. Well, no, and I mean, that, it, that gets to a specific uh, critique on some of the models that have been already put out there uh, on property tax relief, basically saying that, look, if we, you know, whatever the, whatever mechanism we're talking about, let's just say compression is the one that it most applies to. But let's say that we're dealing with compression and we say, OK, we're going to eat you know, as a state X amount of the, the M&O, right? So in other words, that falls off of individual's property tax bill mm-hmm. and then is taken up by the state. Well, then we had that discussion was it a week or two ago. Is that spending or not spending? You know, and that's again giving people their money back is not spending. Yeah. I'm just going to say <laughs> yes, that. I'm not going to argue. I'm, I'm not going to argue. Yeah, because I, I I largely agree. But that being but that being said, is that what, when that was done in the past, the locals are like, oh well, you know, it's it's, it's free money, you know, and so why not just you know, and people aren't going to feel it, so let's just ra- start raising it back to whereabouts it was, and so it basically was a you know a blank check to the locals, and so I think what we're also hearing, we heard that from the governor, we're hearing the discussions and the policy around the capital, is that there's going to be more, uh, whether or not it's a separate bill or it's contingent on this particular bill, whatever the property tax bill may be, we are going to see something that reigns in the locals from basically. You know, just spending us out of house and home. And now, you know, we've always discussed that this is a local phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we have to go in and bail it out at the state level is neither, you know, is not a good alignment of incentives. So I think we're going to see something. I think we see action on it. I think the governor obliquely referred to it. And I think we're going to see uh, those strong controls come in along with that property tax relief. And, and as our, our economist friends always remind us, uh, you know, high taxes are always a result of spending. So yes. it's all we've got to get back to spending. That brings me to, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, the speaker's speech. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Speaker Dave Phelan was here. He gave a, a, a great speech. Absolutely. Um, again, just, just went through all the issues. One of the things that he said, which I think is, is, is the third really important point on uh, – on property taxes is that is that families have to feel it is that families have to see their property right. taxes going down and he says you know people come up to them all the time and they say oh well you know we did property tax reform you know in the last session and my property taxes only went down sixty dollars well the alternative was them going up six hundred dollars and, and and that's been the average is that yeah. they've been going up hundreds of dollars a year absolutely forever and and they're finally leveling out even if we all we did was pay the same that's a huge benefit that's you know money in in people's pockets that they would have had to have otherwise spend and now yes it's only fifty sixty dollars at a time yeah. but it's going to get bigger it's going to get gradual mm-hmm. um, and it's and the most important thing is it's not going up 
up. So right. a really important point um, uh, I think that he made. <clears throat> a couple of the things on the, the speaker's uh, speech, you know, I thought surprisingly he spent a lot of time on health care. Mm. Um, and just in the politics of it, uh, I think he, he spelled out at the beginning, he said, look, you know, Republicans have ceded the issue of health care to the liberals for a long time. We shouldn't be doing that as conservatives and, and Texas Republicans, particularly in the House, have not. Mm. And so he spent a, a little bit of time outlining sort of the successes that they've had over the last session and then how they're going to improve on those successions. Right. Uh, one of those being, and this big issue for TPPF, is price transparency. Mm. Um, you know, this is a, this, this, this should be a set them up, knock them down down type of issue. Um, but, but what do you think the, the projections are for, for getting, you know, press transparency through the House? Oh, I'd say, through the House, I'd say, I don't want to say almost certain, but I'd say, I'd say north of 90%. Mm -hmm. You just don't see, you just don't see, you know, people wanting to take up and carry water specifically for a special interest. And here, it's not even, it's not even uh, specifically like the health insurance plans. It's the hospital owners. Mm -hmm. It's the hospital owners. And so having price transparency is not going to hurt their business. It's just going to allow better consumer behavior around their business. Mm -hmm. You know, so much. And, you know, you and I, I think it was two weeks ago, two episodes ago, maybe, where we actually talked about price transparency. It is absolutely galling to figure out, to think that there's people that would rather pay the the fee for non-compliance and mm -hmm. keep those prices obfuscated, yeah. then actually just let the consumer know what they're going to spend. Right. And I know, look, I'll be the first also to admit, you know, kind of diving into all these policies that I do, that the application of any one of these issues are usually more nuanced, like how are you, you know, is it sure. the posting or whatever? Devil's in the details, all that. Absolutely. But, th but the point is, this is about as simple as it gets. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't like a multi-phasic thing. This is something where it says, let them know what the average price of Procedure X is, mm -hmm. and everybody's golden. Yeah. And there's still abstinence on that. It's ridiculous. The, the speaker hit a lot of different issues. Um, healthcare obviously was a, was a really big one. You know, what I, what I also uh, saw is from the governor and the speaker is there was a lot of talking about, look, Texas is in good shape. I mean, Texas is an economic driver. Yeah. You know, one out of 10 kids is educated here. One out of every four new jobs is made here in Texas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, people are voting with their feet. We've talked about this before, how, you know, the, the left, you know, after we passed our new abortion laws or new gun laws and, mm -hmm. and a lot of our, our uh, social laws, get essentially, the left complained and said, well, you know, Texas is a hellhole. Well, the, re the, the speaker said today 1,100 people are moving here every single day. And that's so, up. And that's so up. Yeah, and that's up, yeah, from, from where it was two or three years ago, which you can't even believe. I mean, in Austin, it feels like it's, you know, it's like 1,100 people every hour yeah. are on Mopac. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, uh, so, so obviously that, you know, that's not taking place. People are, are coming here because we, we do have, we have a lot of challenges. We have a lot of things we got to work yeah. on, but we do actually have a, a pretty good, a pretty good system here. You know, I mean, this is fun. I mean, we're doing this here from, from, uh, from uh, our, our Texas Policy Summit. We're getting a little bit of an audience. Maybe we should do a, you know, a, a live show at some point. Maybe take this on the road and, <laughs> and, and go and, and do these shows uh, live. What do you think? I think that'd be a great idea. I, I just don't want to, we just don't want to devolve into that whole like that, that, that fraudulent uh, thing you're seeing online these days walking up to, hey, person I've never met before, what do you have to say about this? And it's this <laughs> articulate, entirely crafted response. About, and something that's incredibly, uh, you know, in depth would be like going up to somebody, hey, what do you hear? Think about these new calls for uh, rejuvenation of 313. And this guy on the street's like, well, as you know, corporate incentives and tax abatements are an important issue these days. Yeah, it's like, man on the street. No, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Man on the street who we've never met before is like, but no, I'll joke it aside. No, I think that'd be great. I think that this venue is, is awesome. And I do think that, like, the interest, and I got to say, as an aside, the feedback that we've got on this show alone, hmm. uh, just here at this conference, has been absolutely overwhelming. I've had individuals, you know, you know, that we're not related to. So it's been fantastic. Yeah, that we're not related to. You know, I didn't have to give you the slide that five dollars to you yeah, know, to mom to them put off. in that uh, to give you that five star review yeah. on iTunes. But just to say, people all across the political spectrum have had good feedback. Different people like different parts of it, mm -hmm. but overall the feedback's been nothing but positive, and I've really appreciated that. Maybe we'll get the uh, the pod for all. Or what is the the left wing guy? The guys that do the Obama podcast. Maybe we'll do a debate with them. Yeah. Uh, um, at them at some point. Well, so it's not just keynotes. I mean, we obviously have, you know, we have the big three at the Policy Summit. Yeah. Um, we have, um, I mean, Vivek Ramaswamy is going to be giving a, oh, yeah. his, his keynote tomorrow. He, he, he confirmed with us long before he decided to run for, for president. We obviously have, like I said, Mike Morath uh, at the end of today. But there's a ton of other, there's literally nine uh, sessions going, or three sessions going on at once, three times today. We've got, you know, we've got a ton of other issues that we're talking about. Uh, they talked about parental empowerment yesterday. They talked about ESG. 
ESG. We're doing more mm. on energy and and several uh, issues on healthcare. Um, you know, what do you think? One, what's one of the ones that's sort of under the radar that you're interested in going in and hearing the speakers? Uh, I mean, I'd, I honestly, I would hear you know just about anybody. But uh, I think some of the ones that unfortunately, I don't know if I'll be able to uh, attend. And one of them, two are double booked or booked at the same time. So one of them, I'll have to go back and watch the video when it's done. But we have our uh, election integrity panel mm. uh, featuring uh, Chet Adams from the Secretary of State's office, uh, as well as some uh, some notable nationwide speakers. Mm -hmm. We also have on top of that. We have the uh, panel by our Center for American Futures, the litigation case starring, uh, featuring Michael Cargill, uh, whom the, who they're suing on the, uh, this case focuses on the, the 4473 paper. You know, in other words. Yeah, the forms where you, exactly. you have a clerical error, but then they shut down your, your gun business because they're attacking gun owners. Absolutely. And Michael Cargill, if I can just take an aside on this guy. So he had just won a bump stock case. We are now approaching, uh, you know, we are, we are getting to the, the end stages of the 4473 case, and we're working uh, separately on a, another gun case uh, with some of our other attorneys on the pistol brake stabilizers. Yeah. So, like, the, the amount that TPPF is putting in in sweat equity into Second Amendment policy issues on the litigation side yeah. is nothing short of amazing. I think we're going to get some great policy out of it. And that particular panel, we're going to be launching a brand new video discussing his case. Um, so we're really excited about that. We'll have, definitely get that out. And if y'all missed any of the uh, TPP, we're live streaming everything. We literally, everything that we're doing, all these panels, even the concurrent ones, mm -hmm. we're live streaming them all. Um, but if you missed any of it or you missed the governor's speech or, or whoever, um, all of it will be archived um, on our website website and on our YouTube pages uh, where you mm -hmm. get this show you can you know click on over and you can see basically we're gonna have all of them up hopefully within the in the next 24 hours everything mm -hmm. will be be online um, all right so so the buzz is in the air everybody you know we're all talking about the issues you know what's we're, but we're still within that 60-day window yeah. you know we're still we still haven't quite yet hit the sprint um, uh, of, of you know legislative session and votes happening and all that um, so it's it's next week right like mm -hmm. next week we hit that 60-day uh, um, what do you what do you expect? I mean, is it just going to be like vote after vote after vote, and we're going to see a, a flurry of activity, or what do you expect? Not if the pass is any indication. I think you're going to see the chairman or chairwomen of the different um, committees setting their priority bills early enough, if they can, if they can. So keep in mind, it needs to be filed, it needs to be read once and referred, and then it needs to be set uh, in advance of a committee hearing. Mm -hmm. Now, if all those boxes are checked, then they can go ahead and, and set it for a hearing. But just given, and I, and I know I'm not speaking out of school because this is a problem that has been acutely felt not only for multiple sessions, but across the board, mm -hmm. is ledge council is way behind. Now, mm. Some of that is still hasn't fully recovered from the COVID. Some of that is the fact that the bills are getting more complex. And certainly part of it is the fact that the bills are getting more numerous. Yeah. Now, all that means ledge council gets bogged down, bogged down. There's cascading effect where it gets slower and slower and slower. So it's getting a little bit of a longer turnaround and getting things out of there. Remember, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, the deadline, or a week ago or two, the deadline passed saying that if you don't have a request in the ledge council, we can't guarantee that it'll actually be drafted by filing deadline. Now, take me through the process real sure. quick, because I, th I mean, even the insiders and the nerds like like us don't really know how that works. Like, members obviously don't write their own bills, or maybe they do, or or does or does the process require, you know, a, a blessing from ledge council in order for it to become a bill that can actually be submitted? Like, talk a little bit about Correct. that. So again, without going too much into to I, the, the, again, the complete tea, tea leave <laughs> reading detail. What happens is that every bill must be touched by ledge council insofar as at least it just gets a filing number, mm -hmm. right? Now, what it takes to get that number varies greatly. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you can have a bill that's already on their pre-existing form, that's written out, that everything's good to go. It still needs to go through the process, it's more or less, but it goes through a lot faster. Yeah. Or, say I go to ledge, I'm, I'm a member from you know, Erath County, and I want to go to ledge council saying that, you know, Brian needs to wear a tie every day, you know, and there ought to be a law. Vote no. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, the, the Brian's Against Ties uh, Coalition there we had go. a big, uh, big capital go. day the other day. Anti-tie pack. <laughs> tie pack, yeah. yeah. But no, let's say something like that. And you would go to ledge council and say, you know, you'd have outlines saying, as of right now, it is not illegal not to wear a tie on those days. I want to make a criminal offense so that if the, Brian's not wearing a tie, that is subject to a Class B misdemeanor or something okay. like that. 
And so they go, okay, so we'll have to go, then they'll walk through, they'll go, okay, let's see, this hasn't been done before, so we have to start from scratch. Uh, we have to go into the penal code because that's where we're probably going to put it. Uh, we're going to have to set as a class B misdemeanor, so we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And they do all this together. Find out there anything referencing this. Are there any sartorial standards act that we need to uh, abide by? All <laughs> the, that stuff to say. Federal code we need yeah, to adjust? A, 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 exactly. Well, that, yeah, the Clean Ties Act of uh, whatever that the Obama administration is using to close down ports or something. But all that to say <laughs> is they will go ahead and do that and then produce a, a, a bill on that. Now, again, the simplicity usually dictates how long that takes to do. Yeah. But that being said, is that until they've actually kicked it out, it can't be filed. No. And the filing deadline is at the same as the 60 days. So once that comes and goes, you know, that's basically what you have to work with. Now, is that the end all be all? Can things not get amended on? No, not at all. Because I've heard of, you know, there's been wild stories, at least maybe maybe this was when I was in Congress. But, you know, wild stories of people writing bills on the back of paper bags and, mm -hmm. you know, or writing amendments in the margins oh, yeah. and then getting voted on and stuff. Oh, can yeah. that happen? You see a lot more of that on budget night or people trying <laughs> to, uh, you know, pull. Right but, before Sonny dies. Yeah, but, but a lot, I will say for most of the contemporary contentious bills and high-profile bills, uh, so far they've actually passed House rules with pre-filing amendments. So basically saying they need to be in two days before, so the stack will be available in yeah. a PDF two days before. And so that way you can look through. I mean, because again, Congress isn't really motivated incentive-wise to function well. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we absolutely need to pass the budget. We absolutely need, by priorities of the big three and the membership generally, to pass a number of other priorities. Mm -hmm. Bills must pass in Texas. Yeah. Bills needn't pass in Congress. And so we end up seeing more of a good faith effort. No, don't get me wrong. There's disagreement. There's strong disagreement. There's vociferous disagreement. But there is an impetus to passing legislation versus just letting things die on the vine. So uh, getting back to what we were originally talking about, that's a, that was a good nerd out, I yeah. think, um, uh, for some of our insider uh, viewers. I but, should put on glasses and do this every time. Yeah, right? <laughs> Professor, uh, Professor Cohen has come out and, and schooled us on the ins and outs of, of writing legislation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but getting back to what we're talking about, you know, there is a backup in, 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 ledge, uh, in ledge Council mm -hmm. uh, for various reasons. Uh, but, then, but then when does, you know, when does the voterama start? Because, you know, I've seen yeah. sometimes, you know, when the, the speaker is yeah. literally going through bills in mere seconds right saying you know we were reading other report we wave the reading we do this yeah. and boom and it goes like when does when does all that start the, the, that'll start probably two weeks or so after oh. the uh after the deadline passes because the, the ones that are just absolutely you know machine gun you know built, yeah. those are the local naming, yeah. naming post offices and things yeah like that. those are they're the ones where like come out they'll read like two or three words from the caption they'll get gaveled and then they'll say anyone have anything to say about it nope pass yeah and so they they do that now senate can do that as well passing vote bills as a slate uh, that's a little most senate senators are owed the debate mm -hmm. and i think that we can see from lieutenant governor patrick it's always been his imperative to run that uh, chamber to allow debate to happen when it wants to happen so even bills that are of less controversy than some of the stuff we've seen on the house local and consent you will actually see them given debate and you'll be like why are we even I mean, this this seems pretty good, and then they're like, you know, they'll talk about it for three minutes so that the inter the questioning senator can say, oh, I think it's a good bill, and I can and I'll vote for it. And if we haven't done enough shameless plugging already for uh, for our policy conference and our various products, that's I, I will do a shameless plug for our one of our newest products, one of more, our more popular products. Now, oh yeah, is is a video that we do called the layout, in which we allow members to come in, or not allow, but we ask members, and they're happy to do it, to come into our studio and for five to seven minutes actually lay out their bills, because a lot of times you. Either miss the committee debate or the miss the committee hearing, um, and you don't even really know what these bills are about. And I think I think members find that um, worthwhile to be able to come in and talk about you know what you know, what is the problem that they seem right. to be trying to address. And, so it's been a great opportunity for them to come in and talk about it. And, and you know, I mean, there, we we do peel into some some of the the more contentious parts of those bills, but the whole purpose of this, and I and I definitely don't want to speak for or take credit from your yeah, your amazing comm staff, uh, Brian. But one of the things that, the, that this serves, one of the uh, points of this product, is to get outside of the, the media bubble mm -hmm. because so much of what we see in the coverage of the Texas legislature, I, I am going to be as charitable as I can <laughs> and say it's because of policy ignorance. Yeah. I mean, you and I just spent, what, five minutes last week talking about, the, about SB2 and how about how it doesn't Election change. Integrity mentality. bill. Absolutely. And yet I point out, I go, look, this does not change 
the mens rea of a particular offense. It it clarifies some of the elements of the offense, saying that I can't crack open your head and get into a mens rea. That way, we talk about the circumstance, right? All that to say is, it was written up by a partnership organization from a major outlet here that this is changes the mens rea and it's voter suppression. And then what did we see in Fake the hearing? news? What did we say in the meeting? Oh, in the hearing, it was, oh, this changes the mens rea. It changes the mens rea. There is not a single person who works in criminal justice, because, I mean, obviously this has to do with the, the criminal intent standard, that would think that that was the mens rea. Yet you had one person after the other. And I'm just saying, maybe it's... Because just, they're getting bad information from what's being reported. Absolutely. Right. So with this, what this allows, the product, this allows somebody, to, uh, a member, to come and actually walk through their bill... Mm -hmm. With, you know, and give their, and then sometimes get pushed back on some of those sensitive issues. And to be honest with you, you know, it's open for conservatives, liberals, what yeah. have you. Because I mean, I'd love to have some Democrats come in and justify some of the crazy ideas that yeah. they have. Or, or even better, some of the good bipartisan ideas they have. You yeah, know, sure. I mean, there are few, sure. few less of those, but, they're, but they yeah. do exist. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, and it's funny you bring up the, the media. I mean, and I'm definitely not a person, you know, who likes to sit around and rant at the media all the time. I got a lot of friends. I mean, I work in communications, so we work with the media um, on, on different things. Um, uh, but it is, it is frustrating. And I think, and you know, I, I do want to be charitable and say that it has to do with ignorance and not necessarily is always propaganda. Um, you know, but you just, but you definitely see it. I mean, there was, you know, one article I read the other day from one of the left-wing outlets in, in Texas literally used scare quotes every time they used the term school choice. Mm. You know, it had to be school choice. Like, that's not a real thing. Like, we're making that up. Like, they, we haven't been talking about school choice. Neither schools nor choice exist. Right, yeah. exactly. But literally, I mean, I swear that it was like they, they used the phrase like 39 times in the article. Mm. You know, everything you need to know about the, you know, the school choice movement and every single time they yeah. you said school choice was in scare quotes. So, you know, you see stuff like that and you're like that's not just ignorance that's a choice like you're making a, a choice to do that. well i mean look at you look you need to look no further than uh texas monthly which uh, which i will give credit where due is that i find their uh barbecue ratings usually pretty accurate usually pretty spot on <laughs> they dig out a place that i have not been to yet i visit i'm like wow this has been a hidden gem so shout out texas monthly now let me tell you how much of trash this article is that i just read from them <laughs> so that being said is this whole the behind the campaign to destroy public education which not only that now that got very ad hominem with people on our staff yeah, with some of my yeah. with some of my employees and that is completely unforgivable talking about you know our friend uh trish quintero uh james quintero's wife yeah saying that he's she's basically doing his bidding for having been out with them in public i can tell you listeners she is the one who he is doing the bidding of, first and foremost. <laughs> Secondly, that she would need permission from her husband to advocate I for her children? How what. disgusting is that? And of course it came from some, you know, some hack that used to write for the Austin Chronicle or Observer or whoever ranks which, uh, you know, which LGBTQ bar is the best in Austin that particular year, whatever they're doing. But it's not legit journalism. It never should be seen as such. Yeah, that was and that's, despicable. Yeah, it was. So, you know, and, and, and that's why I don't get upset about it because I don't, I have long since um, uh, lost the idea that, that yeah. journalists were going to be referees and just yeah. reporting the news. They wear a jersey just like everybody else. Yeah. So if you, you know, if you take your approach that way, then, then you know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, uh, you know, we you know we really we need we need to not do this segment without Sherry Sylvester. I feel like oh yeah, like she she needs we're gonna have her on as a guest sometime. In fact, she's walking up right here. Oh yeah, uh, speak speak of the devil. Um, but we, she she's the one who can really tell us about uh, you know former longtime advisor to to Lieutenant Governor. She's oh, the yeah. one she's the one who can tell us and has the real institutional knowledge. She used to be a reporter herself. So mm -hmm. She's literally been on the other side. So if we're gonna do a, a, a rail on the media day, yeah. we definitely need to do that. We can uh, use this as like a her. tease for uh, it coming up. Yeah yeah. yeah <laughs> That'll be good. Um, so anything else? I mean, I, I feel like, you know, we've kind of exhausted a lot of the issues. Um, anything else about the conference that you're looking forward to? I'm looking forward to Lieutenant Governor's speech. Uh, not because I think it's going to uh, cover a lot of the conservative priorities, even though I'm you know, 90 percent sure it will. But just I don't think he's going to try. I, I think he's going to try to, to outkick what we saw from the House, what we saw from the governor. Yeah. But I, I and that's not an enviable position, because like you mentioned, the governor and the speaker of the House, my goodness, one of the one of the, you know, when it comes to event planning, one of the most difficult speaking spots is breakfast. Now, Friday breakfast, usually a little tougher than Thursday breakfast. <laughs> 
But 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 those breakfast spots, you know, people are gra- you know, people might have uh, had a lot of uh, you know networking the night before. A lot of networking. A lot of networking. A lot yeah. of cards, uh, business cards being exchanged. A lot of exchanging. Um, but uh, all that to say is, they might have been networking the night before, getting up early and being able to rouse a crowd like that. Yeah. I, I, you know, just my hats off, and he hit the and he hit the nail on the head with so many issues that we need to deal with. Yep. And so, governor killed it. Speaker killed it. Tomorrow, I'm I'm really excited about the um the the panel on Hispanic conservatives. Oh uh, the yeah. Rise of the rise of Hispanic Republicans. Uh, Myra Flores, who's now is with TPPF, uh, former uh, c- uh, congresswoman, is going to be um is going to be hosting that panel. So uh, I think I'm I'm super excited to, to hear from them and kind of get their perspective on on the major you know political shifts that are happening oh, yeah. in the Hispanic community, particularly in South Texas and the Valley, um and get their their take on you know what that portends for the future of Texas. And we had her, I mean, we had her on the show, I believe, three episodes ago, and she just absolutely killed it. Absolutely killed it. It's a a perspective that conservatives need to be hearing. It's one that we don't frequently hear um, because, you know, even... Even as outnumbered as true conservatives are here in Austin, we still have that Austin bubble even for conservatism, right? Mm -hmm. And so hearing people who share those values but have them applied in a very different location is something that honestly we have not done enough of and the fact that we're going to have that panel tomorrow i'm really looking forward to it well all right so i think uh for our next show we're definitely going to have to do a a deep dive into this anti-tie wearing bill uh yeah that that we discussed uh, we should have the author on to explain it yeah, get him on the layout. Get him on the layout and, and talk about it because I will be all for uh, not all for not mandating wearing ties. Um, all right. Well, thanks again for listening. This has been a special edition of the Right Idea. Uh, we're super excited about the conference. Things are still going. Things are still exciting. There's a lot of buzz in the air, um, and so we'll we'll uh, we'll continue to do that. Again, if you missed any of the, the the sessions or any of the speeches that we talked about, all of that will be online. All of that will be archived uh, right here on our YouTube page, so you can all check that out. So as always. As we always like to close with uh, Sam Houston's uh, wise quote, do good and suffer the consequences. We'll see you next time.